Hello and welcome to the Life Together podcast, where we share in meaningful conversation about living for Christ and loving one another. Thanks for joining today, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Well, hey everyone, I'm here today with Philip Russell, and he's joining for the second time here on the podcast. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to the first one, God is Bigger, uh, you can scroll down in Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast, and you can find that episode. I think it was the first or second one that was that was uh, published. Uh, but today's episode, what we're going to get into is kind of a back-to-school podcast. Um, here in mid to late August, uh, we have uh, pretty much everyone has started back to school by now. I think there's still a few maybe homeschoolers who, who haven't started yet or lagging behind, just kidding. Um, but as you know, there's all kinds of challenges and opportunities that come with it. And we just want to explore all those things in this conversation together, and we hope that it'll be beneficial. Um, but Philip, let's let's uh, start with what's going on in your world. How's life now that school has started up again? It's good. It's exciting to see the students again. So there were there were about two weeks where we worked a couple days just inside the building doing some training, which is fine. We had one one of our trainings was really good this year but then this week in bowling green schools we got to see the kids and that just brings a level of energy and it's important for my work so my work is college and career counseling my title is the college and career readiness coach so focusing on the whole school to some degree but mainly the seniors and helping them get from the start of their senior year to wherever they want to go post-graduation whether that's getting a job joining the military going to college, helping them with that transition and everything that goes with that. So I need the students in the building for me to really do my work. So it was really good to see them this week. And even as we're recording yesterday, I got to do my first classroom visits, which is really the start of coaching and guiding Mm -hmm. students in that process. And I'm meeting with students, helping them apply, helping first generation students apply, refugee students, immigrant students apply for colleges and look at the kind of jobs that they can get. So it's a really exciting time. We're just kind of a shot in the arm professionally. Yeah. Wow. I can imagine how special that would be. And at my high school, they would always, actually in our whole school district, they would do like a convocation. I don't know if that's a thing that they do here. Um, But I got to go to that my junior and senior year. uh, And it was so special. Like there's such an energy in the air and of course, you probably have some teachers who are maybe dreading the end of the summer, <laughs> right? Um, but for the most part, it was so special. It was so cool to see all of these teachers, um, some of which you know I, I had through the mm-hmm. years, who were just so excited to see the kids again because that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's cool. So what what do you think of the new the new school building? It is amazing. So when I switched into the college and career counseling role, I I got moved from the new part of the building to the old part of the building, which was a little bit of a bummer. And then last year, we were in the final phase of the construction. So there were several of us, our head principal, our school counselor, who's in charge of our special ed students, and myself. We were all in offices, put air quotes around that in closets. So I was I was Whoa. in a closet all last year. The head principal would walk by and like call me Harry Potter and that kind of thing oh, being hilarious. shoved in the shoved in the closet. But this year everything's finished. Our front office is all is all squared away. So I'm around my colleagues who do school counseling up there. And then we have a beautiful courtyard. So our school is like most buildings, a rectangle essentially, but it's massive. And so we have the courtyard in between open, between class changes, Mm. at breakfast, at lunch. So kids can go outside pretty much every class period, take a breath of fresh air, go back into their next class. They can eat outside. They can eat in the shade. They can eat in the sun. Mm. So it's, it's an exciting time because the kids are back. And then it's an extra exciting time because we have a beautiful new facility that we're getting to use. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. 
whatever happened to recess, you know, you get to high school <laughs> right. and they just rip it away from you, or I guess middle school. Yeah. And that's cool that they can still go outside. I think that's so uh, important um, to kind of have that, that mental break throughout the day yes. and enjoy nature and not feel imprisoned, you know, uh, within the, within the school building, but it does, it looks beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like driving by it, I was like, whoa, you know? Um, so that's really cool. I, and I'm excited for, you know, all of our kids here at Lost River who, who get to experience that. And, uh, that's, that's a really good, good thing. So education, uh, you've been teaching for how many years now? Well, I know you, you kind of switch roles, but how long have you been at, uh, BJ, BGHS, is that yeah. what you'd say? <laughs> yeah, so this is my eighth year at Bowling Green, and I taught for one semester at Warren Central prior to that oh, okay. because I graduated in December. I pretty much knew that I would be at Bowling Green the next school year, but they had a full-time job available, so it was a really good opportunity to get full-time experience as a classroom teacher for a semester prior to what I kind of think of as like my first full group of students that I had at Bowling Green. Okay, cool. Wow. So, so eight years in Mm -hmm. education, but you also kind of have like a legacy of education in your family. So tell us a little bit about that. And then maybe what eventually led you to decide this is what I want to do. Because I mean, we all know that sometimes the way that people talk about education is everything's going downhill. It's all falling (laughs) apart. And you know, um, it's not exactly like it's the most high paying, uh, opportunity out there. My sister's in education and I hear about the difficulties all the time. And I heard a lot of people say different things to her when that's what she decided to do. So anyway, I'm, I'm curious, uh, take us through what it was like, um, kind of inheriting that legacy of, Mm -hmm. of being an educator and what led you to step into that world yourself. So my mom is an elementary school teacher. So for a long time, just being kind of a typical teenager, I was thinking, I'm not going into education. I'm going to find my own path. And then I have this almost stereotypical teacher story. I had an amazing, like the greatest of all time, English teacher my junior year in high school. His name's Matt Thomas. He still teaches at Valparaiso High School up in Northwest Indiana. He's a finalist. He's going to be a finalist for Indiana State Teacher of the Year this year. So he's in contention for that, which from my perspective is like finally, finally getting the recognition he deserves. So watching him teach myself and my friends when I was a junior, I thought to myself, I could do that. I could see how much fun he was having, how transformative it was for me. So after that school year, I decided I'm going to be a high school English teacher and went all the way through. So that's one level of it. But education is my family's business. I am the fifth consecutive generation on my mom's side to work in public education. My great, great grandmother was an educator. And then on down my great grandmother, my grandfather, my mom, and now myself. On my dad's side, I'm the fourth consecutive generation to be an educator, but I'm also the fourth consecutive generation to come to Bowling Green and get an education degree from WKU. My great grandfather was a farmer. He grew up in a big farm family, but one of his sisters came to WKU when it was a normal school, which essentially was a trade school for teachers. So she was here, I think it was called the Western Kentucky Normal School or Western Kentucky State Normal School. She came here, my great aunt came here and got an education degree. And then my mom and dad both have education degrees from WKU. My dad's sister does as well. I have an education degree from WKU. A bunch of my cousins do as well, and they teach over in Boyle County where my dad grew up. So we are like dyed in the wool education family. And on my dad's side, like we are WKU educators as well. So growing up, I fought that for a while. But then when I got into high school and started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, I'd experienced just an outstanding education. And as I grew and matured a little bit, I realized how that had shaped me to be ready to take those next steps. And it felt like a worthy 
profession to dedicate the rest of my life to. So I kind of went from punk teenager, rejecting what my family had always done to then taking a step back and realizing there's a lot of good that comes from public education. Hmm. Wow, that's a that is quite the legacy <laughs> yeah. in education. Wow, like five generations back on one side, four generations mm-hmm. back on the other. Um, that is that is really special. And Matt Thomas was mm-hmm. the name, right? Um, that's that's interesting. So he was an English teacher, you mm-hmm. said, and that's what you ended up doing for six or seven yep. years. Yep. So what led you? to make the decision to step into sort of the counseling side, because if that's kind of one of the things that so inspired you, Mm -hmm. this example of Matt Thomas being an English teacher, what made you decide, as awesome as this is, Mm -hmm. I wanna step into the counseling component? I, I had a really unique opportunity with my first two groups of students. So I taught freshmen in 2016 and 2017. After that, one of my best friends at work resigned and I took over her course load, which is going to be primarily juniors. So I got my first group of students back that year and then I got my second group of students back the following year. So I only really had two groups of students my first four years in education and developed just amazing relationships with so many of those students And through those relationships and through some of those writing prompts, they started opening up about the burdens that they were bearing as as high schoolers, as high schoolers who were busy with extracurriculars, with social pressure on them. And I wanted to help in some way, but I realized as I was talking to some of those students that my skill set in helping them was extremely limited. Mm. So after a few really difficult conversations and then kind of being a bridge to some of the mental health professionals we had in our building, I decided to pursue a master's degree in school counseling. Went through WKU's master's program in school counseling, really enjoyed it, and decided to apply for the role that I'm in now, not out of like being tired of the classroom or being tired of teaching English, but thinking this was a really good and maybe even a rare opportunity for me to use like this specific master's degree that I pursued and thought at least for the time being, I'll give, I'll give this a shot and see how I can serve our students in a school counseling role rather than the classroom teacher role. Yeah. Gotcha. Wow. Well, I can definitely, I don't know, I guess from my perception, you've just been so naturally gifted to serve in that way to counsel and connect with kids. And I mean, maybe I I would assume that's absolutely true, but all that to say, I feel like I've seen that in teaching the high school class together Mm -hmm. the past two summers, Genesis, the first trimester, and then this summer, the gospel of John. Um, And like, not only are you such a, a gifted teacher and I've enjoyed getting to sit in on your classes and do all this thing together, But like the way that you have connected with the kids has been, I think, really unique. And they not only resonate with your style of teaching, but the way that you relate to them. And that's just been, I think it's created a really special environment. And so through whatever natural giftedness you already like had and whatever sort of um, like practical things in counseling that has maybe helped form your approach to that, like... I, I don't know. It's been awesome to to see and to try and learn from in some ways. So maybe we can get a little deeper into that in a moment, but I kind of want to go to like a 30,000 foot view. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, educators here mm-hmm. at Lost River. And then uh, aside from just all those in education, you have a lot of uh, families mm-hmm. who have kids who are involved in different school systems, whether it's homeschool, private school, public school. Um, and there's, just like we started with, there's an excitement, there's an anticipation at the start of the year, but maybe also a little bit of trepidation. <laughs> um, not just, uh, you know, the teachers bracing themselves for impact, mm-hmm. but uh, the parents and the kids too, because school 
as wonderful as it can be, also comes with a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. So in your eight years of experience, what have you noticed to be, let's start with, I guess, let, let's start with maybe the negative side mm -hmm. of that, if that's all right. Like what have been some of the most challenging things first from an educator's perspective, and then maybe we can talk about what you notice the kids are dealing with in today's culture. Yeah. Well, I think they're, they're related. Part of why, part of why I decided to get the school counseling degree initially was to bring that back directly to my classroom. I didn't have the statistics at the time, but I think I was witnessing the adolescent teen mental health crisis mm. that is very well documented in our country. High, high numbers of anxiety and depression amongst our, our teenagers and our adolescents. And I wanted to help in some way because not only, not only could I see it in what the kids were writing, you can also see it on kids' faces and you hear it in the conversations that they're, that they're having. And I mentioned this earlier, but just the burden that kids seem to feel to participate, to be extremely busy with school and a bunch of extracurriculars. And many of our students at Bowling Green try to be involved in their church or in their youth group. And then on top of that, you have this pressure that they feel to stay connected online. So they're trying to be active in what in the real world in a sense, but also in the digital world where they have so many connections with friends who are here with friends who they might know in in other places. So there's this constant perpetual going that our students are experiencing. And I think a lot of them are suffering from just a lack of rest. And again, I was experiencing that and watching my students go through that and wanted to try to step in in some capacity and offer and offer some healthier, healthier ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think the point about social media is really good. And, you know, we had uh, our teen weekend, I guess, two teen weekends ago on social media. And I don't know, maybe that was a bit of a. Um, a sounding the alarm of sorts, mm -hmm. but I know this isn't what this podcast is about. And I, I plan on sitting down with someone soon to just talk about social media, mm -hmm. but it is, I mean, it, it is so correlated with yes. the skyrocketing rates of anxiety and depression among teens. And it's not just that you have this, uh, they're not only dealing with the pressures of being, even just present in a school, but but then uh, you know the, all the pressures online as well. And, and what seems to happen is all those pressures online get sucked into the moment mm -hmm. at school too. So it's like this almost like this negative feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in that loop, then you're just out of touch because so much of what the kids seem to talk about has to do with what's been happening online, what they've been seeing their peers do, but also what they've seen different social media influencers be a part of. And so it's like, if you're not connected on social media, then it can be very difficult to make friends, mm -hmm. to connect with people, to understand what they're talking about and what's going on in the world. And along with that, I mean, so many other negative things as well, everything from body image for both boys and girls yes uh to uh very misleading messages that try to present what maybe we could say is a false gospel a false good news like hey this is the life you should live mm -hmm. and it's driving this is interesting like it's driving boys and girls further and further apart from each other as this algorithm tracks their interests and feeds them it's just it it's so it's, it's such this ominous interconnected web that has, I don't know, reached into so many aspects of mm -hmm. what otherwise should be a relatively normal growing up experience. 
And so I think that's a really, really good point. And that's interesting to hear from an educator's perspective. Yeah, I, this is exactly what I see uh, in the school system. If parents or anybody's listening to that, I guess two additional things. If you want to think about what's happening to us in our technology, even think about your own personal experience when you hear or feel your phone buzz mm. or when you hear it sound some notification there's almost this automatic response to reach for it mm. what that in a very small sense what that shows us is that our phones have trained us and that means they've trained our brains like at a neurobiological level like our phones are doing something to us and what the correlative research says right now is it's probably not good it's i think it's pretty clear like it's not good what the constant notifications are doing to our to our brains but if you want like a professional's take on this Jean Twenge is someone who has done extensive work she wrote a very well-known Atlantic piece the mm -hmm. monthly magazine back in 2017 it has kind of a sensational title it's called something like has have smartphones destroyed a generation but she presents a compelling case um, about some of the negatives of smartphones and she has several books on that as well so like we know it's doing something to us even just in how we experience technology as adults it's doing something to an even greater degree to adolescents because of their brain development and then jing twangy can be can be a good resource if you're looking for that i would say besides the technology my experience is adolescent so i know we have a lot of elementary educators and so many elementary school students so i can't speak into that as much but I get to know students at a time of immense change in their life. Students, it is um, especially the boys from freshman year to senior year, it can be just an astronomical difference between a 14-year-old boy and an 18-year-old young man who, who leaves the, the halls of Bowling Green High when they graduate. So they have physical change. There is social change change that's developmentally appropriate but also really difficult to go through cognitively their brains are rapidly developing in in high school and then what what we what i've been able to see just since last summer and this summer teaching the high school class there is also very real spiritual change and formation that's taking place in high schoolers high schoolers who are involved in in a church and year by year we're talking about big dramatic changes that are that are taking place and while a lot of that is good and it's developmentally appropriate it's very difficult mm. and it presents and compounds on some of those challenges that you met, mentioned with technology like even isolating something like the physical changes that young people go through some young people go through that a good number of people go through that and think i don't like the change that has just happened to the way I look, to the way I feel. And that can lead to anxiety and self-image issues. Socially, we know young people are trying to find their peer groups and find meaning within their peer groups. And that's hard because there's going to be distance that occurs from the way young people once upon a time interacted with their families and then how they're interacting with their families during high school. And that's natural and it's appropriate in some respects, but it can also lead to feelings of guilt if they're not spending as much time with mom and dad or with siblings and they're spending more time with peers. So I think it's good for our whole church family just to be aware that when you look over for us at the front left corner and you see our adolescent students up there, just recognize and maybe get into the habit of praying for them specifically about the immense change that is taking place because we can look over there and kind of lump together the junior high students all the way up to the high school students but that's a dramatic change that's taking place between between those age groups yeah yeah what i kind of hear in that is well one change mm -hmm. I, he I hear that and then also this awareness, mm -hmm. both a self-awareness and just becoming more aware about the world. And that can be very disorienting. You can start to become aware that 
maybe my childhood wasn't as great as I mm-hmm. just assumed. I thought every household was like mine. I thought every family was like mine, but maybe not. Or maybe it's the other way around. You start to learn about other families. You assume that everyone else's family is just as awesome and great and spiritual and godly as yours. And then you start to realize, oh, my friend's family, like they they don't eat dinner together mm-hmm. every night. In fact, they don't really eat sometimes at all. Like, mm-hmm. And you start to become aware of the world and, and the brokenness of it. Your, your eyes are open to see the differences and the struggles that people are going through. And then that self-awareness, which, you know, ties back into what we've been talking about before. But I think that's, that's really interesting. No, I think that that idea of recognizing the change and then being patient and gracious as students are walking through that change, they feel it. Yeah. Like at a, at a multifaceted level, they're feeling it physically emotionally, socially, cognitively, like, and that's weighty for, for our young people. And that's why, that's why at times teenagers can get a bad reputation, but it's also why it does take maybe even more grace and patience to work with teens, to have teenagers in your home than it might for even younger kids. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a great point. And what to me is kind of interesting about that is they develop this awareness while also thinking they're all alone. Mm. And this is such a common quote, but everyone is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. I wonder if there's nothing if there's if there's no scenario in which that's truer than with high school students Um, because you know a lot of you know you grow up and you meet people and you connect with friends maybe in college and you start a family and you have those people that you can kind of depend on and share Mm -hmm. life with but in high school you become so self-aware and so self-conscious that you become isolated and feel like you're the only one going through all these problems and all these changes and so i think that's such a great point to to emphasize for all of us like it it takes a lot of grace and patience and reminding them of how deeply they're loved mm-hmm. by us and by God yes and then through our example encouraging our high school students to do that for one another mm-hmm. and then to do that for their friends uh at school um so yeah so so that's some of the challenges that students are facing from an educator's perspective, I remember we talked about one time your experience of feeling overwhelmed. Uh, you, I guess, just took a lot on your plate <laughs> and then realized that this was not a sustainable way of living. And I imagine there's a lot of people feeling like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, not just in education, but in the workforce, in what, in whatever way, who feel overwhelmed. So tell us about that, and then maybe that can kind of be a segue into from an educator's perspective, what challenges do y'all grapple with? Prior to the pandemic, I was teaching full-time English and I had a couple advanced courses and a journalism course that meant there were just kind of extra responsibilities on top of the normal teaching load that I might've had previously. I was coaching cross country and track. So I was coaching distance running, which translated to basically year round, six days a week practice. I was getting a master's degree and I was active with WKU mentoring and working with some of their teacher preparation program. So I had a ton on my plate and every bit of it was good stuff. Every bit of it was something that if you kind of isolated it, you'd say, yeah, like that's a good thing to do. It's good to use my experience and help those younger teachers. Coaching was amazing. I had so much fun getting to interact with kids in a different context. But when it all came together, it was way too much. And what I didn't realize until the pandemic hit was how shallow I had been living for, at that point, multiple years. 
so there's a there's a writer that calls that kind of living hyper skimming like you're hyper skimming along the surface of life and not experiencing any kind of depth relationally uh, or even just with the events that you're in because your mind is always thinking about what's next and you can't be present in Mm. the moment. And I had kind of trained myself early on in my career to be hyper efficient so I could get everything done. But at the end of the day, there wasn't a ton of emotional, spiritual energy left over when I got home with Sarah at the end. And it took the pandemic and everything in my life coming to a screeching halt to realize that there was a significantly more healthy way for me to live. So the challenge to kind of connect this back to educators more generally is finding a real and proper balance between the worthy, really good, important job that we have and then the rest of our life. One of the things that I see from from educators sometimes is that there's this idea that their life or that their job is so important to them that it becomes primary in their life. And again, it feels like a worthy endeavor, but there's something dangerous about that spiritually when when you start putting pressure on the job itself to become the source of fulfillment. And it was interesting a couple of years ago after after the pandemic after we really during the pandemic when we came back to school We started a wellness committee to try to see how teachers were actually doing. And we gave a researched and validated survey to our staff just to get feedback and see if there was anything we could do as a high school to make the experience of teaching better. And one of the statements that scored lowest from our teacher's perspective was teaching is as fulfilling as I expected which isn't to say it's not fulfilling. There's still some level of fulfillment, but what we were hearing from teachers from that survey and from some of their open responses was, there's still a hole in me. Like teaching's not filling the hole like I thought it would. Like I thought being an educator would be my avenue to fulfillment. From our perspective as followers of Jesus, we can say pretty definitively in an isolated way, your job is not the source of your fulfillment. And that is that is something that I think educators might really struggle with. And again, it comes back to that idea of can we balance, or another way to phrase that I guess would be, can we see our careers and our jobs rightly? And can we see them through the lens of being part of our spiritual formation, not the primary goal and aspiration of our life? Mm. not being able to to rest Mm -hmm. i think is a great sign that of what we're allowing to form us like if if we are exhausting ourselves with work no matter how great of an endeavor that is and how even spiritual it it feels in in christ like it it feels to pour yourself into that Um, if we're constantly exhausting ourselves with it, it's probably a good sign that we've turned a good thing into an ultimate thing or a good thing into a God thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such an easy thing to fall into. And here's the crazy thing, even in ministry, like that's the same thing. Like you can turn ministry, a good thing into a God thing Mm -hmm. and exhaust yourself in it rather than this, I guess, kind of goes back to Kyle's podcast on uh, ruthless elimination of hurry, but in, 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 instead of being able to rest, and that rest is a version, is a way of trusting in God. It's a way of saying, I trust that even if I don't exhaust myself in this work, like he is working. Mm-hmm. I can rest because he is working. And he's working in the lives of these kids. He's working in the lives of all these people in school that I, I'm wanting to influence, that I'm wanting to help. Like, I trust that I can 
take a step back and he's still going to work. Mm-hmm. And it's not all about what I can pour into it. Yeah. And that's, that's where the word balance became so important to me because the balance was I'm going to work hard when I'm at my job, but at the end of the day, I'm going home. Mm-hmm. And when this, when this pivot happened, it was, I'm going home to be present for Sarah. And now it's, I'm going home to be present for Sarah and Lydia. And I'm going to make sure that I'm working in such a way where they are getting like as much as I can at the end of a workday, like my full presence, my full emotional capacity, because that's, that's where I want my, my primary work in a sense to be like, I want it to be with my family. I want to have the energy to do work here for Lost River and for our church and even things in the community as well. And one of one of my good friends who left education phrased it helpfully for me. She said, I can't work like a martyr. Mm. And that that was so eye-opening. And she said one of the things that when she was leaving teaching education, she's still working in higher education. But she said, I don't want to work with a martyr mentality. I want to work like a professional. And I thought that was a really helpful way to kind of change my own habits and my own thinking of, again, I, I feel like I need to kind of hedge this by saying education is so good. I love it. It's what I wanted to devote my professional life to. But at the end of the day, it is a job. It is a job. And what I'm trying to live into now is that there is so much more to my life than a job. And and for the educators who might be listening to this, like I think there's like a dead poet society kind of idealist in the back of all of our minds that hears that of like it's just a job and we go, no, it's not just a job, like it's a calling and it's all this. It's a job. And we need to have space for us to be people and not just educators or from our perspective as followers of Jesus, we need our souls to be well and not just to be um, geared towards a career field of education. Yeah, that's that's so powerful and important. And it makes me think, again, this is an allusion back to, to where what we talked about with, with Kyle uh, Pearson, but how like Genesis 1 into Genesis 2, it it climaxes with the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, when you start thinking about who this was written to, it's written to people who were just rescued from slavery. And it's like God's way of like impressing on their hearts and reminding them like, you are more than the bricks you make. Mm -hmm. You are more than the work that you do. And if we can't develop that Sabbath mentality about life, then we're always going to just be defined by how many bricks I make, what I contribute to my career, or maybe it's something else, but I'm going to be, I'm going to find some slave master. As you were, as you were saying that, I was going to save this for later, but Matthew 11 comes to mind and Jesus' beautiful invitation. I'll just read it. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I I believe and Sarah and I are working to experience now that that is something that we can live into and feel on a regular basis. This is the invitation, one writer says, the invitation of the easy yoke. Hmm. And for the majority of my career, I can say that in a very real way, I rejected that invitation from Jesus. And the last several years, I have been working, and Sarah has been so helpful in being patient with me. 
I've been trying to change my approach to my career to live into this, to experience the easy yoke from Jesus, while at the same time seeing my job as my way of working and keeping the world like we're instructed in Genesis. Genesis.